Good morning. For those that are visiting and for those that are regular, you know that I'm not the regular speaker. Brother Mike, he's got gallstones, but he's like Iron Man. He keeps on going. So I was going to fill in for him, but I'll do the regular third, third Sunday. So bear with me today. And Brother Mike will be back next week. He seems to be, a, he's got amazing pain tolerance. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, for Brother Mike, for all that you do. Hopefully, this is cut over. Can you hear me now? All right. So, I like to start off with experiments. Can anybody tell me what you see right here? <laughs> Doesn't look quite right, does it? So, first glance, it's the Eiffel Tower, but there's a canyon below it. Let's see if this works. Right here. That's not supposed to be there, right? But it looks like it is. And if you look down below that, there's a street, even way down below there. So, for those not familiar with Eiffel Tower, it's in the middle of Paris. Actually, give me just one second. Is that better? All right, cut out the echo just a little bit. We got an omnidirectional that picks up the singing. It kind of gives a little bit of feedback when we're talking. So, this is the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Now, this is an illusion. What's really happened is a very clever artist has basically laid, a, laid out a sheet over this part, and then back here, does it work? There's a facade that goes across, and it matches up really well. Whoever did this was really good at what they were doing. Now, we can see that now that we pointed out, right? Is anybody familiar with what the Eiffel Tower is really supposed to look like? Well, if we were going to disprove this, how do we do that? What do we do? So this very clever and talented artist put this together, and they put this facade up. And when we look at it, it looks real. Now let's take a, a second experiment. Let's step back a little bit. Now, now that you know the truth, let's try reverting back. Can you put yourself in the mind of somebody who didn't know the truth, who knew that that was real? They would swear to it. It's like, that's the tower. Oh, that's not it. That's the tower of I Eiffel. That's the part of it. That's it. Can we imagine that? It's hard, right? And you're probably thinking, where is this guy going with this? But bear with me. It'll hopefully it'll make clear. So once you know the truth, it's hard to unsee it, right? It's hard to not know what's going on. And if you want to disprove it, you can go and say, okay, this is France. There's the mountains. And there's Paris. Not in the mountains, right? We can point it out. It's facts. We know that. We can take a topographical map and see that. But, and we can say this is what it actually is supposed to look like, right? It's really flat. It's in the middle of the a town. It's a tower. It doesn't actually look like this. But if somebody really believes that, how do you deal with that person? What do you do? So, today, I want to talk about delusion. Somebody thinks up is down, down is up. How do you deal with somebody like that? And in the Bible, there's a really good story about this. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 44. We're going to spend pretty much the whole time in Isaiah 44. Let's read about a group who are delusional, who for life of them, they thought what they had was something special, but it was just not what it's supposed to be. So let's turn to Isaiah. Let's start with verse 1. So Isaiah 44, 1 through 5. Isaiah 44, starting at verse 1. And this is God talking to them, talking to the, the captives of Babylon. 
Yet hear now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, who I am chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb. Who will help you? Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. They will spring up, spring up among the grass like willows by the watercourses. One will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Another will write with his hand, the Lord's, and name himself by the name of Israel. This is how Isaiah 44 starts out. And at this point, things are really good. God is speaking to Israel, and you can see the caring nature of the relationship at this point, right? God forms us in the womb. He helps us. Our quirks, our differences, our, our things that make us uniquely us, God can make it into something incredible. And we may not see it at first, we may not even understand it at first, but God does. He's even using a pet name here, Jeshurun. That means upright one. It's kind of like saying to the dog, good boy, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, more, it's more tender, but to just give you a sense, it's basically, it's a, an affectionate name. God talks of pouring out his spirit and his blessings on the descendants. And these descendants, they respond by claiming their heritage. They want to be God's people, associated with God. And this is nice. This is how things are supposed to be. This is how things can be if we stay close with God. And this section lays out a scene that makes you realize that God really does love us. He's talking to the people, the captives of Babylon. This could easily be just for us, too. And when we realize that, it gives you like a big smile on your face, right? That God Almighty loves us. These words apply to us the same as Israel if we join his family. We have a God declaring his love in this first section, which is an incredible concept that the almighty rule of the universe cares this much about these weird little creatures called humans. It's kind of hard to see, but that's, he does. Now let's read on to the next section and see what happens. We'll take this a little bit verse by verse for a moment. Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. In this section, God states very clearly who he is. The Lord, the King of Israel. You can also think of God as our King, too, and we should. The Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, the first and the last. And there's a lot in this verse to unpack, but we're not going to go here for right now. But basically, God establishes who he is. He's the existing one, the rule of all, the one with the all power lies with, the one who came before creation, will be there after this creation ends. If you think about it, the power of God is mind-boggling. And he's already, he's laying out who he is, but he just told us that he loves us. Just by his nature in the universe, we should love him, right? If he created us, he's going to be here before we're here, here after we're here. Just by his position alone, he deserves our love and care. But not only just he deserves it by our, his authority, he loved us first, which is a very, very amazing thing. And so, well, if God is so wonderful, are there any others who could compete with that? Well, let's read on and see. And this is still God talking in these verses. Let's go to verse 7 and 8. Isaiah 44, 7 and 8. And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me. Since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. So is there another God out there? Anything to compare? No. <laughs> we know that. And God, this is an interesting thing, 
he can see the physical, he can see the spiritual, and he's basically looking all around and saying, yeah, there's nothing else out there. I am the God. I am the only one. And if you notice, he's not saying, take my word for it either. He's saying, you are my witness. You notice this. You see my creation. You see my works. He's saying, you see this too. You know it too. And you know something interesting else about this? Notice how God responds to the question, is there a God beside me? Now, in how many other places, like in Deuteronomy, the Ten Commandments, there's no other God but God, right? Single. But notice what he says right here. Indeed, there is no other rock. Now, if you look up the actual Hebrew for this, the rock, it's basically like a large rock or a cliff. And in this time, that was basically a refuge. It was a hiding place. So when he's saying, is there any other God before me? He's saying, no, I am your refuge. He's actually still pointing it toward these folks that he's talking to. Even he's established he's the Almighty, he's still caring about them. He's still saying something that's relevant to his audience. So, even when he's declaring that he's God and rightfully should be loved for his place in the universe, he's still phrasing things that draws in the people he's talking to. He's still putting in their terms He's still showing that he's on their side and he cares about them. He could simply say, folks, here's the facts. Spotlight. There it is. And walk off, right? He's God. He could do that. Why doesn't he? If you're in an argument with somebody and you go back and you look at all, all the maps and you say, here's all the facts. Boom, 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 boom. Does that change their mind? I can see some heads shaking. No, it doesn't, does it? It doesn't matter if you've got all the facts in the world. If they're emotionally invested in what they've got, if they believe that is it, the facts are important, and you've got to have them, but you've got to put them in something that they can care about too, right? And that's what God's doing. He is the most powerful being in the universe. And he's basically saying, look, folks, I'm going to put this in something that you can understand and care about. That he's phrasing this way for humans is incredible. He's showing incredible strength and strength in his approach. Now let's go on to the sec next section and see what the delusional folks are doing and where they got into. So keep this in mind of basically that he loves us, he's established who he is, and he's on our side. He's starting with love and he's going forward. So in his next section, Notice a little bit how it's not personalized. It's not going, you did this. He's given a scene. He's going to give something basically that they can look at, detach from, depersonalized. And it's, this is a little bit more tougher love section for the folks. But it's still love for the audience. And the folks that he's been talking to, the, the captives in Babylon, had done this and much, much worse. So this is kind of like a, uh, a tame version of what they had done. Isaiah 44, 9 to 11. And this will kind of go into the situation here in a moment. But this is him basically laying out some facts. But he, look how he does this. Those who make an image, all of them are useless. And their precious things shall not profit them. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a god or mold an image? That profits him nothing. Surely all his companions would be ashamed. And the workmen, they are mere men. Let them all be to gather together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear. They shall all be ashamed together. Now the captives in Babylon were captives in Babylon because of idolatry. This is what put them in that place. And so he's presenting it in a way that basically lets him detach a little bit and look at it. He's not saying, you did this, or you did this. He's like, hey, what about this? If a guy just forms something and calls to God, is that right? So, and those captives, they were delusional. They had said, hey, that sculpture's pretty. Oh, great bird head dude, I love you, save me. 
And it's that's silly when we look at it, right? But that's what they had done. That's what it got them into the situation. But God's put it in a way, it's like, okay, what about this? These folks. And from a distance, it's silly. But for these folks, this is what they were talking about. And so look how he phrases it so they actually can see things. And let's go into the next part. He's trying to basically get them to say, hey, maybe that's not right. Maybe that's not the way it should be. And notice how the language, the sentences, they're short, they're direct, they're simple, right? We're not talking about like a long treatise here. This isn't Paul talking to philosophers of the age and talking, you know, deep metaphysical things. This is just straightforward. Here it is, folks. And that's important. If you're talking to somebody who's really invested in something, do you want to get into some deep, complicated argument? And it's not going to work very well, is it? They will tune you out and walk away. The folks in Babylon were captives. They were captives. Their homeland, their homes, all gone. Things were not good for them in captivity. They came back from captivity with names like my holes, fleas. They were not doing very well. It wasn't an easy situation to deal with. And the way it's phrased, when you call somebody useless, that, doesn't, that ends the conversation, right? That's not the way to do it. If you tell a smoker, how many of you have known a smoker or been smokers yourselves? If someone comes up to you and says, hey, that's going to kill you, what do you do? Or what do they do? Yeah, that's nice. They walk away. The guy on the street corner going, you guys are going to hell, you all sinners! How many converts do they get? Zero, right? That's not the way to actually approach anybody. You might get some rotten tomatoes thrown at you, but you're not going to win anybody's soul. Taking it back a little bit, depersonalizing it, talking to somebody about something they're doing from a distance, it gives them a chance to be able to talk without getting defensive, without having to defend their ego, without having to basically get them on where they're basically spending more time to protect themselves and actually listening and engaging. And it's really cool how God's doing this. Now, notice what he's doing. He's pulling back the curtain and going, hey, that's dangerous. And if you see something like a volcano from a distance, you know, step back from that, right? If you're a crazy person, you're thinking, oh, that's awesome. I'm going to go take a look at that. That's cool. Whee! But we know to look at that from a distance. God is gently pulling back that curtain to let them see what the other folks already know. And so he's firm and direct, but he's not insulting to them. That's really dark. Let's go back to um, Isaiah. Let's go on to chapter 12, or verse 12. Isaiah 44, verse 12. And for those who just joined us, most of the, the scripture will be coming from Isaiah 44, if you want to turn there with us. And glad to have you here with us. Isaiah 44, 12. The blacksmith with the tongs works in one in the coals, practices it with hammers, and works it with strength of his arms. Even so, he is hungry, and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. Now, in this example, if someone's hungry and they're tired and their strength fails, what can we tell about that person? They're human, right? How many of us have been hungry? How many of us are hungry right now? I am. <laughs> How many of us get tired? And please don't fall asleep while we're doing this. We all we can all sense that, right? These are universal emotions. What God's doing is basically he's given an example that every single one of us can relate to. And every one of them can relate to. And so he's being direct, he's being firm, but he's basically like, hey, you know what I'm talking about here, right? And we all can. We've all been in that situation. And so the bottom line is we're all mortal. We're not God. And that's what God's getting to. These things that are being created, they're being created by someone just like you, just like 
than every other human out there. And so if the person God's talking to is still paying attention, it's pretty clear the contrast between God and the person that's working the, in the shop, right? Now, God has taken this one verse and he's reminded us that humans are not God. He's given us a scene that we can all relate to. And so the conversation brings the listener in. It draws the people in. It's like, I get that. I've been there. I, I can understand that. It's not anything to be defensive about. It's not anything to, to kind of bristle about. It's basically, yeah, I can relate to that. Now, let's go on to the next scene, verse 13. Verse 13. The craftsman stretches out his rule. He marks one out with chalk. He fashions it with a plane. He marks it out with a compass and makes it like the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. Now this scene is subtle. It sets things up for the next scenes even more than what we've been at. In the first scene, you got clear that the maker is human. They're mortal, they're fallible, they're hungry, they're tired. All relate to that needing food and rest. In this scene, normally a craftsman is a good thing, right? You see somebody working in a shop, that's commendable. They're working with skill, they're working with their knowledge, they're building some sort of beauty. That's a, usually a good thing. What goes wrong? In this scene, there's a twist at the very end. Now notice at the very end of the verse, so that it may remain in the house. They're taking something that is normally good and commendable and making it kind of dark and twisted, right? Why is that piece of wood in that house? And what's going on with that? Non-delusional says, it's a nice piece of art in the corner. No big deal. I like it. It's pretty. Delusional says, oh, great bird in the corner. Woo! Save me. Right? It's a big difference between just the wood bird and the idle bird, right? But those folks, they did not see that. And we'll get to why they didn't see that. But let's keep going. Let's go into verse 14 through 17. And this is the third scene. And this scene basically kind of dives deep into it. We're, we're, we've kind of stepped up to the illusion. Now let's just go straight into it. Isaiah 44, 17, 14 through 17. He cuts down cedars for himself and takes a cypress and the oak. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine, and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in a fire. With this half he eats meat, he roasts the roast, and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it? He makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it and worships it, prays to it, says, Deliver me, for you are my god. In this scene, we start with something innocent and move quickly to something that's very, very wrong, right? Verse 14 starts out with God's creation. It's beautiful. Trees. You got an oak, a cypress, a, a pine. Beautiful trees, nice things to think about. God's creation. Move on to something else innocent. Use that wood from those trees. He's making a fire. He's grilling some food. He's staying warm. And then from that innocence and nature, and using the resources for fuel, things quickly go awry, don't they? Those resources from nature that God provides us, they get used and a craft is made. There's something wrong with that craft. And it's not that it is the craft, but that craft gets elevated into something that it is not. And notice in verse 16. Right. There's a dichotomy. You've got a mixture of beautiful nature, beautiful craftsmanship, and lies, which mar it all. You get the dark image. The lies take that innocence and that beauty and turn into something reprehensible, something to be despised. And where does the lie come from? The guy working the wood. 
right? They literally cooked their food and kept warm by one end of the log, made a sculpture out of the other end, and decided, that's it, that's my God. I've made one, woo, yes. And if you think about it from a, a 20,000 foot view, how arrogant is it to think that you can make a God from a piece of wood? But they did, that's delusion. And why did they do that? Why did he do that? So in that scene, we'll go back to this one. Why would somebody build a fire, cook some food? You're hungry. You're tired. Right? Those are universal things that are going on. What does he say to that God when he builds it? Deliver me. He's scared. He's going from something innocent to something vile because he was scared. He made something for himself to basically bow down to to save him because he was scared. And that human had a choice, right? And here's a softball question. When we're scared, who are we supposed to turn to? Y'all know this, right? It's God. Yeah, everybody's looking like, yeah, you know this. I'm, I'm not going to say that. We all know what he should turn to. Why didn't he? Why didn't he turn to God? One of these verses, it's so simple, it's so stupid that he could pick up a piece of wood and go, this is my God, right? From a perspective. We can see that. But these folks were in captivity in Babylon just for that exact thing. So it happened. Oh, well, let's read on, and let's read on about the choice. Why I'm making that choice in that instant of not turning to God, and it's so horribly badly, and looking so very, very stupid, is making mistaking a piece of wood for God. How does that happen? Well, God actually tells us. Isaiah 44, 18 through 20. Begin to verse 18. They do not know nor understand, for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. And no one considers in his heart, nor is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I've run half of it in the fire. Yes, I've also baked bread on its coals. I've roasted meat and eaten it. And I shall make the rest of it an abomination. Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my hand? And this regards with some tough love, right? It lets us see the person where the choices lead. He takes that person and says, okay, you didn't choose me, but let me show you what happens. He lets them see where the choices lead. So in that moment, when they're making that craft, and they're making something, and they just turn it into something bad, God says, well, here you go. Let's take a look at that. And notice, is a piece of wood ever going to save him? Unless he picks it up and beats the guy over the head with it, it's not going to help him, right? That piece of wood's not going to do anything. But God lets him says, all right, you made your choice. Live with that for a little bit and see what happens. He has shut their eyes so they cannot see. And he's, he cannot deliver his soul nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? God's basically giving them over to their delusion and letting them go run with it so that they can actually see what happens. Now notice something here else. Notice how it says, he has not said that. All this other time, it's been God speaking directly to Israel. And this is some of the beauty about the Bible. Up to this point, it's God speaking directly. When they chose not God, it steps back for a moment, and it's Isaiah speaking. It's in third person. He said this. So even in the, the delivery, God is removed. And you can see even from the phrasing of it, something's not right here. Something's different. Something's not the way it should be. 
God was taken out. Now, from our perspective, holding a piece of wood that we carved in our right hand, I think this guy is pretty ridiculous, right? Would anybody do that nowadays? No, no hands. Good. <laughs> Nobody's that crazy. But do we do stuff like this today? And I'd say, yeah, we do. Do we take politicians that are really just grumpy old guys and elevate them to something they're not? Yeah, we do that. Do we take the day-to-day -day things and let them get in front of God and worship in Him? Yeah, we do that too. Do we look for silver bullets and the quick, easy fix instead of actually doing the work we're supposed to? Ah, a lot of people do that. Yep, we do that too. Do we depend on money more than God? Yeah, we do that. Do people still see all of God's creation, everything he's given to us, his hand in our lives, all the beauty of nature, and still go, nope, he doesn't exist? Yeah, we do that too, right? Looking back on these folks who deluded themselves into thinking a piece of wood was a god is ridiculous. But modern humans do ridiculous things too, don't we? <laughs> it happens. We can see where if we choose something that's not God, God will let you follow that path and see what it's like to know what it is. We can actually kind of understand how a highly educated person with all sorts of information at our disposal can do something that's pretty dumb. We all do it at some, certain times, but it's crazy to pick that piece of wood, that other thing over God, no matter what it is. And now that we step over the edge in delusion, let's keep reading to find our way out. How do we help those folks we encounter who are so deluded they think up is down and down is up? How do we pull them out? And God tells us that too. Isaiah 44, 21 through 22. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant, I have formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions, and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. And notice this. Speaker here. Is that first person or third person? He's saying I, right? It's first person. This is God back in the situation. He steps out of the situation. He comes right back in. The Bible's awesome like this. Now notice how he's saying, you're my servant. Is that a bad thing in this context? It's not. It's actually a really awesome thing. He's saying, I've blotted out your sins like clouds. I've basically picked you up. I've redeemed you. God is basically saying, you're mine. I love you. I'm doing everything for you. Come back. And that's the trick, getting God back in the picture. That's how you break through. What started it off, what led to that craziness, is basically making the choice of something besides God. And the only way that fixes that is bringing God back in. If we want that person who's delusional, that we know or love, to see the reality and truth, if you break through to them, we've got to introduce them back to God. We've got to get them to start the conversation. We can't have the conversation for them, but we've got to make that introduction and let them start talking. And that person's got to start to converse with God on their own. Because notice this. You, I, this is a one-on-one, -on -one, right? This is somebody talk, God talking directly to each and every one of them, each and every one of us. It's got to be that personal relationship, and that's how that convention works, and that's how it gets back to where it was. And also notice how God sticks with the theme of loving us, right? This is caring. Even if the person has looked really dumb for choosing a piece of wood over God, God still loves them enough to say, remember these. Remember who you are. Remember who made you. Remember who you are in your relationship to God. Remember that God knows us, has redeemed us, despite our shortcomings. 
Remember to return to God. Now, can we learn from these verses and apply it to things today? Well, if we've shown that we can fall into those delusion things, we can believe up is up, up is down, and down is up. And it's good to know how to get out of the situation, right? When we have tough conversations with folks, and you don't really know how to get it, how to get through to them, and no matter what logic you're thinking of, it's just like it's a brick wall there. The brick wall is there from a choice they made. There's only one person that can get that down. And it's not a person, it's God. And so, when you have those conversations and you're just pounding your head like, I don't know how to get through to them. Remember, it's not you that has to get through to them. You just got to get them to talk back to God and talk the conversation with them. Make the introduction, get it started, support them, and they got to get talking to them. Does that make sense? Because think about times in your lives when you've ever been convinced of something. Was it ever something that somebody else said that basically like, yep, I'm done, 180 degrees, that's it. It doesn't work that way, right? Each individual, every one of us, when we made the decision to follow God, we made it through our own convincing. Our own self convinces this is what's right. I know this. I'm going to make that decision. I'm going to get baptized. No one else does that for you. And so that's basically what God's saying here. It's direct personal conversation. He starts out with love for the person. He loves them dearly. He stays with the love of the person. Even when they're doing stuff that's crazy, he still loves them. He's direct. He's truthful. But he's not insulting to them, right? He's not calling them useless. He's like, hey, what about this situation? You can clearly see this is not right. But it's not getting them on the edge. The people have to convince themselves. And notice how he in, brings it back and ends with love. It's a simple formula, but it works. And if you think about it, it's all worked for every one of us, right? Every one of us who's chosen God, this is how we came to be baptized. This is what led us to it. Somebody loved us. Somebody talked to us. We started that conversation with God, and we realized, that's for me. That's what I want to do. That's how it is for everybody else. So, speaking of ending this, I'll bring this to a close. Give a nice picture to end out with. And I'll take a cue from God, and I'll end with love. I love all of you. And I'm very happy to be here with you, and I thank you for putting up with this message and for me filling in for a week. So with that, I'll say thank you and offer the invitation. If you've made the decision to see God for who he is, and want to join his family, we have water. You heard it filling up earlier in the service. It's there. And no matter if it's today or another day, whenever you have that conversation with God and you are convinced that's right, that's a good time to be baptized and join his family. If there's, you need prayers to the congregation, or there's anything we can do for you, please let us know as we stand and sing your invitation song. Thank you.